intro. Um, hey, yeah, my name is Brian Hughes. I'm a Nebrius everywhere online, Twitter, GitHub, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, quick little bit about me. Uh, I'm a bisexual polyamorous atheist. Uh, I was also born and raised in Texas by two middle school music teachers. None of those places in Texas were Austin either. One of those places was actually ranked as the second most conservative city in the nation while I lived there. So you can fill in the blanks on what that was like. Uh, some other stuff, though, I was also involved in the Node.js project for about two and a half years. Most of the time, uh, I was working on diversity and inclusivity initiatives and trying to fix its, well, its broken culture. And then I resigned last August uh, in protest over uh, a bunch of issues surrounding that. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, I'm actually going to skip to the very end, though, and sort of answer the question uh, that the title or that this talk uh, presents. Uh, so oh, spoiler alert, I guess. Uh, you know, so why does open source software fail to protect under uh, underrepresented minorities? Um, I think it's a pretty obvious answer, really. It's the same reason that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same reason that like diversity and inclusivity is, is just so problematic everywhere else. You know, open source software is a microcosm of the rest of the tech industry. Uh, although I do think that it's those problems sort of cranked up to 11. Uh, because you know these aren't companies. There's no like formal structure in place. There's no uh, compensation a lot of times, and there's no HR department. I mean, you know, as bad as HR departments are for protecting people in tech companies, it is still a little bit better than having nothing at all, which is what open source is. Um, and I do think there's a lot of insight to be learned from some of the in the trenches details that myself and a number of others went through. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, so the story is, if we jump back to the summer of 2015, there was a group of us who went to a conference called Node.js Adventure. And we were talking a lot about uh, just the culture problems in Node.js. And we decided we really wanted to try and work on this and try and fix it. So we created uh, what we called the Inclusivity Working Group. Uh, now, this was not sanctioned by any of the uh, leaders in the project who were active at the time. We just barely had enough context to essentially create a repo uh, and kind of get started. So we all went home, and we kind of pretty much all forgot about it. You, you know, excitement in meat space is hard to translate online. So we kind of just sat dormant until this issue was opened in the Node.js project. As it turns out, there is actually a property on a module in Node.js that is still there today called suicide. Uh, and this property uh, was used to tell some things about the module. Details don't really matter. Uh, this is a problematic property. You never want to name anything in tech suicide. Uh, and this is especially uh, bizarre in the Node.js world because in the early days of the project, one of the Node core libraries actually did commit suicide. Uh, and yet, this still was there. Uh, but as you can see by the very first response there, this did not go over well at all. Uh, and at the time, Node.js had a code of conduct, but it had no moderation policy or enforcement mechanisms or anything like that. So you know, whenever we always hear how you know having a code of conduct that's not enforced is worse than no code of conduct at all, well, exhibit A right here. Uh, and so, like this started happening, we realized we had to start actually doing some moderation because it was getting way out of control. And so we started talking about how to do that in public because we didn't know, and it got a lot worse. This is when Kotaku in action and HN noticed. Uh, and we actually sustained a harassment camp came basically from Gamergate for about, I think, about two weeks or so. It got so bad, we actually had to shut down the issue tracker. Uh, and this was whenever a lot of the leaders in the project realized that, you know, maybe this whole diversity inclusivity thing isn't quite so bad. You know, they at least learned that moderation is something you have to do, at least for trolls. Uh, and so, you know, we, we were kind of re-energized by that, you know, those of us in the inclusivity working group. Uh, and we actually brought in some new people as well. Uh, most importantly, Ashley Williams, who quickly became the leader of this group and was later elected to the Node.js Foundation board. Uh, but the thing is, we wanted to make a difference, but a lot of the leaders, even though they realized there was a need for this, still didn't really want us there. So like one of the first things they said was that we had to get chartered before we could do any work. This was, of course, a flat out lie. Uh, most of the groups in Node do not have to be chartered to do work, but that's what they told us we had to do, so we went with it. Uh, and then they used every chance that they could to basically stall, uh, stall the whole process because they didn't really want us around. Uh, and there was like a lot of gaslighting. And there was even harassment on the part of one of the leaders at the time uh, named Rod Vag, a person who will feature later in this story as well. 
Uh, and, and the rest of the leadership wasn't really doing anything about this. You know, it ranged from just complete inaction, which is the same thing as supporting harassment, to actually harassing. It took us three months to get chartered, uh, and it was just pulling teeth the entire time. And by the time we finally were chartered, everyone was burned out. Uh, and so at this point, Ashley had uh, sort of unofficially stepped down, and we needed a new leader of the group. Uh, and we sort of went through this chain of succession, and everyone's saying no, where it finally fell to me. I was basically last in line of succession, uh, and I was not equipped for this job at all. But if I didn't take it, it was going to fold. So I ended up becoming the leader of the inclusivity working group. Uh, but because everyone was burned out, no one wanted to do any work, and we just kind of ended up floundering again and not really making progress. Uh, until the summer of 2016, in which there was another dumpster fire that started up on Twitter. Uh, and with this, uh, a lot of the people in the inclusivity working group were basically like, you know what, I'm sick of this, I'm out. Uh, and we had enough people leave that the whole group collapsed. Uh, but we didn't want it to just end there. So myself and Ashley, uh, another uh, woman named Tracy Hines, who had joined the foundation as an employee, and a couple of others kind of worked to create a new group. Uh, and this new group was called the Community Committee. Uh, and it was structured in a different part of the organization. Uh, before, uh, the Inclusivity Working Group reported to this group called the Technical Steering Committee, which oversaw everything in the project. And the Community, community Committee was put as more of a sibling, so there's different reporting structures, and there's lots of politicky kind of stuff. But you know, that's kind of the way that we were able to make a little bit of forward progress. And we actually started making some progress in a couple of different areas, because we had an expanded scope but we still weren't able to do anything about problematic leaders in the project. Uh, and so we jumped forward to the summer of this year, and a Rod Vag had started doing some more problematic stuff. There was this tweet, which I'll talk about in a sec, but before that, uh, he had been gone on vacation, something like that. I don't really remember the details. Uh, but during the time he was gone, uh, the group had made a technical decision, something around V8. Details don't matter, but it was a technical decision that was made as a group uh, through lots of discussion. Rod came back, he disagreed with that decision personally, and so he completely reopened this issue to relitigate it, and it got really contentious. Rod ended up uh, basically referring to a bunch of other collaborators as corporate shills for you know, the various companies they worked for. Uh, but even despite this, we still weren't really able to make progress on it. There wasn't um, enough of a consensus in leadership that like, hey, we should actually do something about it. Uh, and it was actually this tweet right here that kind of got us to where we could do something. So if you can't read that tweet, uh, it says, if you've never considered the, uh, I'm actually having a hard time reading it myself. If you've never considered the potential downsides of code of conduct, here's a good place to start. Now, the thing is, if you actually look into what this article is and who wrote it, it was written by a men's rights activist, like a straight up MRA. Uh, he had been saying this kind of stuff for years. Uh, he's also, by the way, an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, if I remember correctly. So he had a platform as well. And so not only is this a problematic tweet, it also kind of tells us you know, the kind of information that Rod was getting and who he was getting it from. And this pissed off a lot of people and rightfully started a uh, dumpster fire on Twitter again. Uh, and so it, it, we finally felt like we had our chance. Like, all right, we, can, we, should, we have to do something about this. And we felt like we had the momentum and political will to make that happen. Now, we had to do a bunch of politics. We politicked for about a month and a half or so, going back and forth between uh, different parts of leadership, talking about how we would go about it, creating a problem statement, uh, and just all sorts of things like that. And uh, we couldn't come to an agreement in leadership, which I was totally expecting that to be the case. Uh, because this is the same leadership that had failed to take action in the past. So we ended up having to force it to a vote. Uh, I honestly, going into this vote, I thought we were going to win six to four. So I, I wasn't expecting to be able to win by a huge amount, but I still thought that we would actually be able to win this vote. But I was wrong. We lost the vote six to four. Uh, and yeah. The internet noticed, as it always likes to do. Uh, fortunately, this time only uh, Kotaku in action noticed and not A-chan, so it was a little more subdued than previously. But still, KIA getting on your ass sucks. Um, and yeah, so we had to deal with yet another harassment campaign. And this was especially true in the IOJS project, uh, which I think there's a few people in the audience here who work on that. Uh, really, really not fun stuff. And so after this vote happened, uh, myself uh, and three other people stepped down from the technical steering committee. Um, I had gotten on the committee at that point representing uh, inclusivity and diversity efforts. Uh, and I also resigned as the chair of the uh, community committee in the process. 
uh, you know, I wrote a blog post about it, made it rather public, hoping to hopefully finally force uh, the hand of the Node.js Foundation. It kind of sort of happened, but not exactly. Uh, the TSC itself was actually disbanded and replaced by another group. There's some weird politics there I'm not going to go into. Uh, but the other three people who left ended up rejoining the TSC. Uh, but most importantly is that to this day, Rodbag is still in power. He is still a, has a leadership role within the project despite all of the stuff that happened. And that's kind of where we are today. Um, I don't know what's going to happen going forward. I like to think that maybe someday they'll make progress, but I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of lessons that myself and others learned throughout the whole process. Uh, this is just going to be a quick sampling for time reasons. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I could talk about and some slides I cut out. Uh, but, you know, still. So the first is that burnout always happens when we're doing social justice and inclusivity work. Um, I just realized that these lines got a little bit shifted, but this is a graph that shows every single person who worked in diversity and inclusivity efforts within the Node project. Uh, separated by whether or not they are an underrepresented minority or not. Uh, that first dotted line, which should be shifted back a little uh, towards me, uh, was whenever the inclusivity working group disbanded. Uh, that second line in the middle is whenever the vote failed. Uh, and then that last line is today. Uh, the reason I kind of put that there was to show that there's a few people who have left very recently. Uh, and a couple other things to note about this graph is if we look, you know, in the early days of the inclusivity working group, the, there were more underrepresented minorities than there were to straight white men. Uh, but that's not true today. Uh, it's much less diverse than it used to be. Uh, and, you know, the groups that are doing this work trying to make things better are less diverse. That makes it less hopeful in my mind. Uh, but another thing that I learned about this is for anyone who's doing social justice activism, we have a shelf life. We can only do this so long. Uh, and it's really important to remember that whenever we do this work, that we have to remember this is time limited, and we have to be thinking about when we're going to leave and how, because it will happen, because we all get burned out. Uh, by the time I left, I was pretty far beyond burned out in that, and it was actually like starting to affect personal relationships and other things like that, too. Um, but I don't think that's avoidable. That's the sad truth of that. Um, another thing I learned is that it takes all kinds of people to do this work effectively. If I look back over the Node project uh, and see when we did make progress, and there were times we made progress. The Node.js project does actually have a moderation enforcement policy now, and it's actually really good at dealing with like trolls and randos, but it does not work for leaders and things like that. But it is progress of some sort, and that kind of progress always happened uh, when different types of people were working together. Uh, so there's a blogger that I've been following for a very long time. Her name is uh, Greta Christina. She does social justice activism in the atheist and skeptic world, which, as you can imagine, is very tough work. Uh, but she uh, had a, this concept, uh, I don't know where she got it from, but the concept of firebrands and diplomats. And I, and I think about this a lot. So everyone who's doing social justice work typically falls into one of these two categories. So a firebrand we can think of as like a protester, you know, someone just getting out there on the front lines and stirring shit up, you know, trying, bringing awareness to this and saying like, hey, this is really fucked up and we gotta do something about it. And then the diplomats are the ones who are going in and making like process change and policy change and, you know, trying to work with existing groups to make that, those very same changes. And, you know, we make the most progress when these two groups are working in coordination. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in Node. You know, we'd have firebrands who were being really active uh, on Twitter and in various places like that, you know, bringing attention to the issue. And then there's those of, uh, people like me, I was a diplomat, that were in place, ready to take advantage of that situation and try and you know, move the ball forward, try and make progress on this. And so it's really, I think it's really important that both groups uh, are talking and communicating and coordinating on this stuff. This is not to say that we should never criticize each other. You know, uh, whenever someone in social justice does something really problematic, of course we should call them out but I don't think we should cut them off because this coordination is really important for making progress. Uh, but probably one of the biggest things that I think I had learned and uh, the most meta thought on this is that we really need to start focusing on harmful ideas and not just harmful expression. Uh, I was in Nashville recently uh, and I had a, a lot of really wonderful talks uh, with a woman named Kim Creighton. If you're not familiar with her, I highly recommend checking out her work. Uh, and, and she really helped me to conceptualize something I've been feeling for a long time but couldn't put my finger on. Uh, and so what I mean by this, by harmful ideas and not just harmful expressions, is how do we define bad behavior? How do we define uh, you know, bigoted behavior and uninclusive behavior? 
Uh, if we look at most codes of conduct, you know, a lot of the modern ones being used, you know, uh, such as like the contributor covenant, citizen code of conduct, and those, like these are really good documents, but I think they're really incomplete because they focus a lot on harmful expressions, specifically harmful language. And there's a bit of an implication uh, to these codes of conduct if you read them cynically, that basically what they're saying is you can be as deeply racist or homophobic or sexist or as on and on and on as you want. Like that is perfectly fine as long as you don't say anything about it. But that's a problem because you know, if we harbor these bigoted thoughts, of course it's gonna come out. Um, you know, it's gonna affect everything we do, but a lot of times codes of conduct don't catch that. And that was a problem with uh, Rod Vag in specific, as well as some of the other leaders in the project, is that they were not put using harmful language itself all that much. They didn't violate the code of conduct all that often. They did sometimes, but most of the harmful behavior they did kind of tiptoed up to the line, but never actually crossed it. You know, they were harmfuling these harmful ideas, but they were smart enough to know not, how to not get in trouble, basically. And I'm not even saying this was conscious on their part. I think it was subconscious. But like that's, we, we often ran into the issue with codes of conduct, uh, with our code of conduct, in that we couldn't actually point to it and say, yeah, this person violated the code of conduct here and here whenever they did this, this, and this. It was, at best, there was a couple of parts that were very vague and ambiguous that could be argued he had violated. But if you have leadership that doesn't agree, that doesn't fly. Uh, and there's, uh, this also reveals itself in a couple other ways, too. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we mentioned microaggressions earlier today, which are a major issue and contribute to a lot of people not participating. Uh, unfortunately, what I've seen in a lot of codes of conduct is they treat microaggressions as specifically about language and language only. And the thing is, is language adapts and evolves so fast that when we take that approach to microaggressions, we're constantly playing whack-a-mole and we're constantly playing a game of catch-up. And um, as Kim Creighton put it to me, which I thought was uh, really, really smart, is we need to get ahead of this curve. Uh, we really need to try and get in front of it and start addressing these ideas directly. We need to start addressing racism itself instead of racist expression, you know, sexism itself instead of sexist expression, uh, and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, because as long as we're just looking at you know, expression, language, and things like that, we're really only treating the symptoms of this. There is a bit of an implication with that, though, too is that we need to be better ourselves uh, as well. Uh, and and you know, I think there's a, perhaps a more sinister side to you know, this expression-based approach. Uh, so if we look at social justice work over you know, the last couple of centuries, uh, not just in tech, obviously, just in society, a lot of that core work was done by people of color, and often uh, women of color at that. And that work is often uncredited, too. Uh, and what, what will end up happening is that usually cis white folks will end up taking this work from people of color and co-opting it for their own, usually without uh, accreditation, and then also subverting it a little bit too. Um, which, by the way, if you're wondering right now, no, the irony is not lost to me, the fact that I'm a cis white guy saying this right now, I'm still processing through that. But like, like this is a real problem that we've had over the years, and we see this time and time again. And this has created major divisions in various social justice efforts. You know, let's look, we can look at like white feminism right now. We can also look at white gay rights, especially in the early days of the gay rights movement, which were incredibly white and incredibly male and incredibly cis. Uh, but like that's, it was these groups, it was cis white people who ended up moving the ball along. That's just a dynamic we've always had. And I think one of the big problems with this especially is since you know, it's mostly you know, cis white folks creating this, we end up setting ourselves up for success by saying which expression is and is not acceptable. And, and we do this because I think subconsciously we know that language is actually pretty easy to change if we are already predisposed to change it. You know, if we want to change language, that's pretty easy. Uh, and so you know, we, we subconsciously realize this. So we basically set up the rules for what social justice progress means. Uh, you know, we set up the rules for success, and then of course we ended up uh, uh, succeeding because we created the rules. And we're like, you know, look, I'm awesome at this. I'm awesome at like social justice. Um, but of course, we're not really. We still harbor these uh, harmful ideas. You know, we still harbor racism and sexism, but we don't have the tells of it, so we think we're better. But you know, the, the problem with this approach especially is that that's once again, it's just surface level. You know, all it takes is for the right moment to come along to just open everything up again. And I think the election of Donald Trump is actually a really good example of this. Uh, you know, if we look at that election, you know, so many uh, white liberals, especially on the West Coast, were completely shocked that Trump was elected. 
but it was not shocking. I'm from the South. I knew the South, and I was never shocked. I, as soon as he got the nomination, I was like, he's going to win. And the thing is, if we look, especially in the African American community, they had been basically screaming at us for decades that, like, this is a major problem, and we'd been ignoring it because we were like, well, you know, the KKK isn't out marching in the streets, right? Because we were focused on expression. But all it took was that one person to come along, and then all of a sudden, we have the KKK marching in the streets again. And, you know, this is also, I think we see this uh, in all sorts of places. Like, you know, we generate a lot of mo momentum to, chair, uh, to tear down, like, Confederate statues, you know, which is an expression. Uh, we've had a lot of progress at that, but we haven't been able to do hardly anything at all to stop the police violence against the African-American community. Uh, and, like, that's a much bigger issue, but that also dives much more into harmful ideas and not just expression. It's not surface level. And, you know, and this is what we need to do, like to really, I think, I think to start making much more forward progress, we need to start focusing on, the, on eradicating these harmful ideas in society. But we're too often afraid to do this work uh, because it means confronting those issues within ourselves first. And like that threatens our self-construction as a good person. You know, we all want to believe that we're good people. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, we don't want to confront anything that would imply we're not a good person, such as the racism that we all harbor, the sexism we all harbor, and on and on and on. But like, we have to do this work. If we don't do this work, we're not gonna make progress forward. You know, we're just gonna have you know, yet another Donald Trump that'll come along in 50 years and we'll be back exactly where we started again. Uh, and <laughs> I wish I had a happier note to end on, but I don't, I'm sorry. But uh, I do have a few things uh, to point out. Um, I highly, if you wanna learn more about this, I highly recommend uh, checking out the keynote by Ashley Williams at InterJS. She talks about the specifics of the, uh, what happened in the Node.js project in much more depth than I did. And also highly recommend re uh, checking out the keynote by Kim Creighton at Node Member, who expands a lot more on some of the things I was talking about here. They're both fantastic, recommend following them. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Hi, thanks for the talk, that was amazing. Um, I'm active in a community that recently went through a similar paroxysm of scrutiny uh, as, uh, as the, the Node community did for similar reasons. And it also attracted the kind of uh, scrutiny from certain online groups that, that, that you guys went to. It's like total deja vu listening to this talk. Do you feel that the latent issues inherent to the Node community could have been solved absent the interference of these groups? or is the, the latent level just high enough that it was unovercomable even without KIA getting involved? Mm. Uh, so the question is uh, basically about the role that like uh, Gamergate, I'll just use Gamergate to refer to all of these groups, uh, that they played in uh, the Nodes Project's inability to solve these issues. Like if those groups had not gotten involved, could we have solved them? Um, I don't think that's the case. I actually think it's the opposite case. I, Ironically enough, I think it's like seeing those harassment campaigns uh, actually motivated people to make change. I think without those, we actually wouldn't have gotten as far as we did. Uh, I mean, once again, I'm going to go back to the Donald Trump election. I'm sorry for bringing this up a lot, but I think it's really relevant. Uh, you know, people are really motivated to make a lot of change. Uh, like seeing you know those groups come out and actually seeing just how toxic and harmful so many people in society are. Is, it's actually a reality check. I think it tells us this is where we really are. Uh, and, and it helps, even people who aren't on board with this idea of like, yeah, I don't know about this whole social, social justice thing, they see that kind of stuff and they're like, okay, yeah, that's a problem. This is actually a problem. You're not just making it up. Um, unfortunately, uh, and I hate to say that, but yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you again for this talk. Um, I. Uh, found it really, really um, insightful and inspiring as a fellow main, main maintainer. Um, and as a current maintainer, um, I admit that I, I've been relatively lucky in my experience. Um, but one of the things that I, I'm thinking about and what you're thinking in your talking about um, changing people's, um, like dealing with ideas, it seems as if, if the implication is almost we need to change people's minds. Um, and um, as a maintainer, I only have so many kinds of tools available to myself, um, a lot of which is communicating with people through um, online media, um, which 
is probably the main way that I'm communicating with people. Um, you know, I, I do communicate with people in person, and that that's definitely something that happens. But um, a lot of it is more online. And I guess as someone who is not burnout and definitely not experiencing right right now, um, given the fact that I do have this energy, what sort of suggestions do you have as ways to deal with these these harmful ideas? Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, if you want to start focusing on harmful ideas uh, and, and like trying to make uh, everything better, how do we do that? Um, that is a very, very tricky and difficult problem. I don't have very good answers to that, unfortunately. Um, I, what I think the best thing we can do is just start getting more underrepresented minorities into positions of power. Uh, just start, and, and that's definitely like a thing that the Node Project taught me is to make change, you have to have power. You cannot make change without power. Uh, and I think it's, we need to start getting more people in power. And I think we need to start showing that, you know, just like racism, sexism, and things like that is not as widespread as people think, or at the very least that they are surrounded by people that actually don't harbor the same ideas that they do. Uh, you know, I actually, yeah, so thinking about like the gay rights movement, this is, I think, a pretty good example in that the way that we were able to make a lot of progress, especially in recent years, was by coming out. Uh, and it was actually, you know, telling our families and things like that. So it wasn't just, oh, there are, you know, queer people over in San Francisco, but they're, you know, my neighbors, my children, my cousins, and things like that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, getting that personal story in there is how we start to erode it. Uh, but now how we can actually operationalize that and actually put that into effect in the tech world, um, that's a really tricky problem. Uh, I would actually recommend checking out uh, some of Kim Creighton's work. She has some ideas on this going into the future that hopefully will work. And it, and it has to do with getting more like founders and business folks uh, from underrepresented minorities into tech. And I think that could be a good answer. All right, thank you. <laughs>